So according to the legacy media, disaster is about to befall America. Donald Trump is now the overwhelming favorite to win the Republican presidential nomination. The latest Des Moines Register NBC News poll shows Trump at 51% in Iowa, up 8% since October. He is gaining momentum. Ron DeSantis is in second place at 19%. Nikki Haley at 16%. According to analyst Steve Kornacki, who's really good on this sort of stuff, there is an enthusiasm gap in favor of Trump. 70% of Trump supporters say their minds are already made up in favor of Trump. He is currently at 72% favorability with Iowa caucus goers. And here's the thing. In the general election, Trump is also up, and he's not up by a small margin. He is up significantly. Donald Trump, if the election were held today, would become president of the United States again. According to a Wall Street Journal poll over the weekend, Trump leads Biden 47% to 43% in the national polls. If third party and independent candidates enter that mix, that lead actually jumps to six points, 37% to 31%. What's more, according to the latest CNN poll, Trump leads Joe Biden by 10 points in Michigan. He leads by five in Georgia. According to the latest Minneapolis Post poll, Trump is down only three points to Biden in Minnesota. In other words, Trump would likely win in a landslide were the election held today. He would win Georgia, he would win Wisconsin, he would win Pennsylvania, he would win Michigan. There are two reasons for this. First, Joe Biden is terribly, terribly unpopular. That same Wall Street Journal poll shows just 23% of voters say that Biden's policies have helped them personally compared with 53% who say that Joe Biden's policies have hurt them personally. That's a terrible stat for him. Those exact same data show half of voters say Trump's policies when he was president helped them personally versus only 37% who say they hurt them personally. Biden's job performance is at 37% approval and 61% disapproval. Only three in 10 voters like quote unquote Bidenomics. Literally the only issues where Joe Biden leads Trump are on abortion, And there, he only leads 44% to 33%, not a huge lead. And tone in politics, 37% to 31%, which means everyone hates both of their tone. That condition is unlikely to alleviate for Joe Biden before the election. It is, according to the Wall Street Journal, quote, less affordable than any time in recent history to buy a home. The math isn't changing anytime soon. How bad is it? According to the Wall Street Journal, quote, before the Fed started raising rates, a person with a monthly housing budget of $2,000 could have bought a home valued at more than $400,000 today, That same buyer would need to find a home valued at $295,000 or less in a time of rising prices, by the way. Average new home payments are up to $3,322 from $1,746 at the end of 2020. That is a 90% increase in average new home payments since Joe Biden took office. What's more, Biden's supposed soft landing, you know, this thing where we bring down inflation, the economy continues to sail along. It doesn't look particularly likely to happen despite the happy talk from the media. November job growth was weak, which was expected. It's what the Fed was actually looking for when they raised those interest rates in order to tamp down inflation. But here's the thing. That job growth was only even in weak territory because of three sectors, healthcare, leisure and hospitality, because we're going into the vacation days, and government employment. In fact, those three sectors, plus private education employment, are responsible for 81% of all jobs created in 2023. That means that Just those three sectors, plus private education employment, that's like all the jobs created in 2023. So when people say they are feeling it's a weak economy, they are right. Business starts are weak. Gross output, which is a measure of the entire economy, not merely the spending side that we see in gross domestic product and which can be jogged by government spending. Gross output has been flatlined. In the first two quarters of the year, business spending dropped 9%. There's a reason that Warren Buffett is pulling his winnings off the table. Berkshire Hathaway sold $28.7 billion in stock in the first three quarters of this year. Buffett has a very simple strategy. Sell when he thinks the prices are too high. He thinks stock prices right now are inflated and too high because they are. Now, Biden's team keeps trying to whistle their way past the graveyard on his candidacy. The literal graveyard, like he might die. According to Semaphore's Ben Smith, at the White House holiday party where Biden has a very easy job, all you have to do is just say a couple of nice things about how you know, you have a contentious relationship with the press, but the First Amendment really matters. And then you say some nice things about Christmas or something. Instead, according to Ben Smith, quote, Biden strayed into a couple of hazy monologues, which ended only when his wife interrupted him to remind him it was a party. His speech wasn't terrible or even noteworthy, says Ben Smith, but everyone in the room realized Biden had a simple rhetorical job and hadn't quite pulled it off. Again, that's a really easy job at a holiday party. I've been to White House holiday parties. Let me tell you, it's not a hard job. But Joe Biden literally could not get through a holiday speech at the White House without Dr. Jill grabbing one of those old vaudeville canes and yanking him off the stage. 
That holiday speech is super easy. So unenthusiastic Democrats are now being forced to defend this ailing octogenarian. Here is, for example, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz. I'll take Joe Biden at 100 over any of these guys at whatever age they're at because he's delivering. Well, that might be okay for him to say, except that everyone knows that Joe Biden is very unlikely to serve a full second term, not giving the state of degradation in which he currently is standing, which leaves in the background, dun, 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 Kamala Harris. Yes, that horror music that you hear. That's the Undertaker's music. Kamala Harris, the worst candidate in American history. Last night, she and Doug Emhoff, she's finding new ways to screw up this job. It's truly amazing. Last night, she and Doug Emhoff, the second gentleman, issued yet another hilarious Hanukkah missive. It's really funny. Every single year, Doug Emhoff being the Jew, you know, he, he's, he's the person they tried out to be the Jew at Hanukkah time. Every year, he puts out some sort of missive about Hanukkah along with Kamala Harris that makes no sense. We'll get to the one that he put out this year because it truly is a classic of the genre. First, think about everything you do or look at on your phone, from shopping and buying groceries to looking up a symptom on WebMD. The scary part is your phone carrier collects all that data on whatever it is that you are doing. They say that it's so they can better understand your interests and provide you the advertising that you want or that you need. But the reality is they make money off of you. The more they get on you, the larger their paycheck. This is why I use ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is an app that prevents your phone carrier from being able to see the sites you visit and sell it off to third parties. All it takes is one tap of a button. All of your network data gets encrypted and rerouted through ExpressVPN's secure servers for ultimate privacy. It doesn't just shield your web browsing, by the way. ExpressVPN protects all your network data so you can stay private even when you're using your favorite apps. Whether you're an iPhone, Android, or even a tablet user, ExpressVPN works on all your devices. The best part is that one subscription can be used on up to five devices at the same time. I've got my whole family using ExpressVPN as well. When your phone carrier tracks you, that's a gross invasion of privacy. You can either keep letting them do it, or you can visit expressvpn.com slash Ben and get the same VPN I use. Take your online privacy back today. Use my link at three extra months for free. That's expressvpn.com slash Ben, expressvpn.com slash Ben. Okay, so back to Kamala Harris and Doug Emhoff. Every single year, they put out a Hanukkah message that makes no sense. Last year, they put out a video about how Hanukkah was about love and light, clearly demonstrating that they actually knew nothing about the holiday or its origins. The actual story of Hanukkah is about religious Jews throwing Hellenists, Greek Hellenists, out of the temple and reconsecrating the nation to the biblical God. It's a very fundamentalist holiday. But last night, they really topped themselves. They confirm they know nothing about Hanukkah with this insane post. So Doug Emhoff put this up on Twitter, quote, the story of Hanukkah and the story of the Jewish people has always been one of hope and resilience. In the Hanukkah story, the Jewish people were forced into hiding. No one thought they would survive or that the few drops of oil they had would last, but they survived and the oil kept burning. During those eight days in hiding, they recited their prayers and continued their traditions. That's why Hanukkah means dedication. It was during those dark nights that the Maccabees dedicated themselves to maintaining hope and faith in the oil, each other, and their Judaism. In these dark times, I think of that story. That is not even remotely the story of Hanukkah. I mean, that's not even like halfway to the story of Hanukkah. It's not in the same Venn diagram that Kamala Harris loves as the story of Hanukkah. I mean, if you're going to talk about the oil story, that is the rededication of the temple. They find a canister of oil. They have to relight the Hanukkah menorah. It's actually the, the, the menorah actually only has in the, in the temple, has fewer branches. They relight the menorah. It lasts for eight days as opposed to lasting for one day. But that was about the rededication of the temple. It wasn't them like in hiding in a cave somewhere. What the hell? Like, what? What in the what? In the, in the what? These are the people who back up Joe Biden. Kamala Harris is his backup. She's even less popular than he is. So that's reason number one why Joe Biden is losing to Donald Trump. It's because he's terrible and his backup is terrible. But here's the thing. The election isn't held today. And this brings us to the second reason that Trump is leading Joe Biden in the polls right now. He is not in the news. That's also the reason that Trump is up in Iowa, head and shoulders above the rest of the candidates. Because he is not in the news, he is beating Biden. Ironically, he's actually using Biden's own 2020 strategy against Joe Biden. It's Donald Trump who's in the basement. He's not running around campaigning. He's literally either in court or back at Mar-a-Lago on Truth Social. And that means everyone's focused on Biden. And that means he's ahead in the polls. And that, in turn, takes the electability argument away from both Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley, which was their number one argument, was that Trump couldn't win, nominate us instead. Because Trump is not in the news, everyone has been able to look away from Trump's crazy which has always been his Achilles heel. Ironically, one of the best things ever to happen to Donald Trump politically was his social media ban because it made him nearly invisible online. The fact that Trump actually put his own money into Truth Social and he doesn't want to lose that money, which is the reason he hasn't gone back to X, even though he's been unbanned on X. Well, that means that we're not treated to a small media wildfire every time he tweets because he's on Truth Social where he has like seven people watching him. 
as opposed to, you know, on Twitter, where he has 70 million people watching him. Mostly for Donald Trump, Truth Social now acts as a sort of venting mechanism and everyone pretty much ignores it. And by the way, that is the best thing for Donald Trump overall. So here is the question. Will things stay this way? Maybe they will. Not because Trump doesn't love being at the center of attention. There's literally no one who loves being the center of attention more than Donald Trump. Donald Trump is Kanye West versus Taylor Swift at the Grammys. I'm going to let you finish losing this election. But first, but here's the thing. There's literally nothing he can do to change anyone's opinion of Donald Trump. Everyone has an opinion of Donald Trump. And they already know what they think about Donald Trump. What exactly could happen if he gets convicted? Did anyone's opinion about him change? But here's the other thing. Elections are about enthusiasm. This is what Democrats are counting on. Trump could theoretically reinvigorate enthusiasm against him if he busts through walls like a big orange Kool-Aid man. Oh, yeah. Trump is already giving hints that he might want to do this. So during his recent interview with Sean Hannity, for example, Sean asked him if he would be a dictator. It was a setup. It was a softball question because the entire left has been saying he's going to be a tyrannical dictator. And Sean was asking him, are you going to do that? And instead of just giving the obvious answer, which would have been ridiculous, ridiculous, they all want Donald Trump to say yes. I'm not a dictator. I was president already. Not, they call me a dictator. Not a dictator. Real dictator, Joe Biden. Very easy answer. Instead, Donald Trump, because he is a performer and a comedian, he played to the crowd. And then he trolled the media by saying he wouldn't be a dictator except on day one. And what he meant is that like Obama and like Biden, he would use a pen and a phone. And he said that he would be a dictator on day one by closing the border, for example, using the pen and the phone. It was a joke, but it also gave his enemies oxygen, which is why yesterday Trump had to actually explain that it was a joke. He put out a truth social saying, quote, Fake news writer Peter Obama Baker of the failing New York Times, readership and subscriptions way down from the good old Trump years, whose claim to fame is that he will never write anything good about the great job President Trump did, in quotes, just wrote in a major front page story that I want to be a dictator, but doesn't mention it was said in a joking manner and completed with, but only for a day because I'm going to close the border and drill, drill, drill. A much different attitude and meaning. Now, Trump is right about all of that. But Trump also has a nasty habit of just pouring gasoline on fires. So Trump's enemies do have one playbook. He will be a dictator, right? Trump doesn't have to play into that. He might, but that is their playbook. This is what all the brilliant minds in the Democratic Party and the media have come up with. Trump Hitler, small mustache, funny hair, orange man Mussolini. Here was Matthew Dowd yesterday on MSNBC doing this routine. Donald Trump wins all the key states because he lost nationally by four or five points in 2020 and barely lost the key states. And so that's what I think the Biden campaign needs to understand in the course of this. At some point, the Biden campaign has to let go of the idea of running this a referendum on Joe Biden or running it as a referendum on Bidenomics and turn this race to here's the choice to present it before America. It's democracy versus dictatorship and it's your freedoms versus your your loss of freedoms in the course of this, including economic freedom in this. Okay, so that is the magic they've come up with is that Donald Trump is going to take away all of your freedoms. Now, that's probably not going to work because he was president already. But this is going to be their playbook. Here was NYU professor Ruth ben who's a scholar on fascism, comparing Trump to Benito Mussolini and, and Pinochet. But we know from, I know from my studies uh, of authoritarianism, uh, successful leaders always have to have uh, powerful partners Uh, And those would be the people in the fossil fuel industry, which he privileged in his first administration, and all those who uh, are are eager to have an enemy, and that's always immigrants. In fact, keeping immigrants out and talking about you, you need national security measures and repression because immigrants are flooding across the border has been used by everyone from Mussolini to Pinochet in Chile up to Trump. This is an old playbook. Well, actually, a really old playbook is is claiming that your political opponent is going to be an evil dictator. We'll get to more of this in just one second. First, you know, it's that time of year where you start thinking about the things that actually mean a lot to you. And because it's a religious time of year, a lot of people think about God. But how do you reconnect with God if that is something you want to do? And we all should be wanting to do that. Hallow can help you. Regardless of your religion, we all need a little more peace in our lives. Hallow is an incredible app that offers a unique approach to prayer and meditation. Unlike other meditation apps, Hallow is tailored specifically for people of faith to deepen their relationship with God. The Hallow app is filled with studies, meditations, and reflections that are rooted in Judeo-Christian prayer practices. This holiday season, access music from the Bocelli family, Bible stories that help you reflect on what the holidays are actually about, and prayers to help bring you peace all on that Hallow app. 
For my Christian friends, it's not too late to join acclaimed actors Liam Neeson and Jonathan Rumi for an incredible prayer experience leading up to Christmas. 25 days of prayer and meditation on the writings of C.S. Lewis. I myself love C.S. Lewis with features like progress tracking and prayer reminders. Hello helps you stay motivated and make prayer a regular part of your daily routine. If you're looking to deepen your relationship with God and improve your mental and emotional well-being, try Hallow for three months free at Hallow.com slash Shapiro. That's Hallow.com slash Shapiro. Go check them out right now. Excellent service again. I'm somebody who prays a lot. Join me your own way by joining Hallow.com slash Shapiro. Okay, so again, the narrative for Democrats is going to be Donald Trump cannot be president because if he is, he will be a fascist. Mitt Romney is jumping on that bandwagon. He has taken zero break from posturing on behalf of his own legacy. By the way, Mitt Romney's legacy now amounts to failed in 2012 against Barack Obama, paved the way for Trump, tried to serve in Trump's administration, was rejected, and then joined with Democrats on key measures in order to shore up his failing legacy. So now part of his legacy is going to be apparently going on like meet the press and jabbering about how Trump is a threat to the republic or some such. We have actually seen him do what he says he's going to do when he said that he believed the election was the election was going to be rigged before people actually went to the polls. He went on to question the results, tried to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Why don't you take him exactly at his word? Oh, I, I, I think we agree that we have looked at his behavior and his behavior suggests that this is a person who will impose his will, if he can, uh, on the judicial system, on the legislative branch and on the entire nation. I mean, when he called people to come to Washington, D.C. on January 6th, that was not a random date. That was the date when peaceful transfer of power was to occur. He called that on purpose. I mean, he, there's no question he has authoritarian rulings and, and interests and no, notions which he will try and impose. OK, so again, that Trump fascist argument is not particularly likely to work. But there is one argument that theoretically could work. Nikki Haley is articulating that argument. That argument is that Trump is unelectable because people perceive him as a chaos agent. Not that he's unelectable because he's a terror, or because he's a fascist or, or something like that, but because he's just too chaotic. We don't want him. Here is Nikki Haley articulating that argument. Chris Christie said he's unfit. I want to just put that directly to you in a yes or no. Do you think Donald Trump today in 2023 is fit to be president? It, it's not about fitness. I think he's fit to be president. It's should he be president. I don't think he should be president. You know, I thought he was the right president at the right time. I agreed with a lot of his policies. The problem is you see our country is in disarray. Our world is on fire and you can't defeat Democrat chaos with a Republican chaos. And Donald Trump brings us chaos. So it's not about being fit. It's just I don't think he's the right person to be president. Okay, well, that argument that Trump is a chaos agent, it only works under two conditions. One is very likely to be fulfilled, the feeling that Trump is, in fact, chaotic. Certainly, that's what the Democrats and the Biden DOJ are doing. This is why they're indicting Trump over and over and over again on every crime from jaywalking to classified documents, mishandling to murder. There's a reason that Jack Smith, that January 6th prosecutor, wants his case accelerated. So yesterday, the Supreme Court agreed to hear Smith's request to hear quickly on Trump's own claims of immunity against federal trial over January 6th. Trump is saying because he was president during that entire period, November to January of 2021, because of all of that, he's immune against some sort of conviction or even a trial. That was ruled against by an Obama-appointed judge. It's been appealed to the D.C. Circuit, and now Smith is going direct to the Supreme Court because he wants an answer. According to the Wall Street Journal, Smith wants the court to take up the case before that lower appeals court even considers it, allowing the justices to squarely weigh in on when, if at all, Trump's trial should move forward. The special counsel's move came 10 days after the trial judge presiding over Trump's case declined his bid to toss the criminal election interference charges, rejecting arguments that he's immune from prosecution. Smith is asking the justices to cut out the lower appeals court and rule directly on the matter. His team wrote, quote, to further the imperative public interest in a timely trial, the government seeks a full and final resolution of the defendant's claims that he is absolutely immune from federal prosecution for crimes committed while in office or is constitutionally protected from federal prosecution where he was impeached but not convicted before the criminal proceedings began, before the March 4th, 2024 trial date. That's according to Smith's team. And the Supreme Court is likely to do that. Smith's team wants Trump on trial, and they want him on trial right now. They are hoping, against hope, that Trump is going to eat all the headlines, that Joe Biden's bad performance becomes a secondary concern because Trump is so chaotic. But even that eventuality, and again, it is very likely that Trump will be on trial after losing this immunity appeal during the actual election cycle. And by the way, it's very likely he will be convicted sometime in the midst of this election cycle. It's also likely that that will not make Biden's case, that Trump is a chaos agent. In order for that to work, Biden has to appear solid and non-chaotic, and that is not happening. Which brings us back to the polls. In every election, as I've said over and over and over again, 
Every election is a referendum on one of the two candidates. The referendum right now is on Biden. Barring some cataclysmic collapse by Trump or magical recovery by Biden, the underlying fundamentals of this race are likely to remain stable all the way up to Election Day, which means that polling advantage for Trump is not a mere chimera. It might just be 2024 reality. And that is why the media and Democrats are panicking. They really, really should be. All right, in just a second, we're going to get to the latest insanity from Harvard University, where Claudine Gay is going to survive being a horrible president, plagiarism, apparently, being soft on anti-Semitism. She's going to survive all of that because she's a black lady. I mean, let's be real about this. We'll get to that momentarily first. From maintaining control of your assets to easing the burden on your loved ones, an estate plan can ensure that your family stays prepared and protected. If you're looking for a way to set up your estate to offer financial benefits and more, you need to check out Trust and Will. It is very, very important to make sure that you have a trust and will. And my, my wife and I have one. It's an annoying process or it can be annoying. The folks over at Trust and Will make it a lot less annoying and a lot easier. If you're looking up a way to set up your estate to offer all of that, you need to check out Trust and Will right now. Traditional estate planning can cost thousands of bucks and many one-size-fits-all solutions might not capture all the important details of the life you've built. With Trust and Will, you can protect your legacy from the comfort of your home starting at just 159 bucks. They've simplified the process of creating and managing your will or trust online from finding out what's right for your family to finalizing documents with a notary. Writing a will can be expensive, tedious. Trust and Will makes it affordable and easy. There's a reason. They have an overall rating of excellent with thousands of five-star reviews on Trustpilot. Secure your assets, protect your loved ones with Trust and Will. Get 10% off plus free shipping of your estate plan documents by visiting trustandwill.com slash Shapiro. That's 10% off plus free shipping at trustandwill.com slash Shapiro. Okay, so meanwhile, over at Harvard. So Clouding Gay looks as though she is about to survive a challenge to her leadership. Apparently, the Harvard board has now announced that they unanimously stand in support of Clouding Gay. This despite the fact that over the past 48 hours, there have been heavy accusations that she actually engaged in plagiarism, not just in her PhD dissertation, but also all over the damned place. According to the Washington Free Beacon, Harvard University President Clouding Gay plagiarized numerous academics over the course of her academic career, at times airlifting entire paragraphs and claiming them as her own work, according to reviews by several scholars. In four papers published between 1993 and 2017, including her doctoral dissertation, Gay, a political scientist, paraphrased or quoted nearly 20 authors, including two of her colleagues in Harvard University's Department of Government, without proper attribution, according to the Washington Free Beacon analysis. Other examples of possible plagiarism, all from Gay's dissertation, were publicized on Sunday by the Manhattan Institute's Christopher Rufo and Carl Stack's Chris Brunette. The Free Beacon worked with nearly a dozen scholars to analyze 29 potential cases of plagiarism. Most of them said that Gay had violated a core principle of academic integrity, as well as Harvard's own anti-plagiarism policies, which state that it's not enough to change a few words here and there. Rather, scholars are expected to cite the sources of their work, including when paraphrasing, and to use quotation marks when quoting directly from others. But at least 10 instances, Gay lifted full sentences or even entire paragraphs with just a word or two tweaked. This is definitely plagiarism, said Lee Jussum, a social psychologist at Rutgers University, who reviewed 10 side-by-side comparisons provided by the Washington Free Beacon, including paragraphs from Gay's dissertation. They actually gave her a prize for that dissertation for quote-unquote exceptional merit. He says the longer passages are the most egregious. Hey, but again, none of that would have broken except for the fact that Clouding Gay went in front of Congress and made clear that she doesn't care about anti-Semitism. That it all depends on, quote unquote, the context. Now, again, Harvard University has one of the most restrictive speech codes in America. They will, they will come after you for fat phobia at Harvard University. But if you say, from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free, while waving around a Hamas flag, everybody will apparently look the other way. All of this despite the fact that the National Association of Scholars yesterday called on Harvard to remove Clouding Gay as president of the university. They noted Gay's shoddy professor, professional work, record of plagiarism, and promotion of racist policies. That was as of yesterday. And again, when it comes to Claudine and Gay's own upset over anti-Semitism, it's just absent. It's not there. One of the things that was amazing about watching these university presidents testify in front of Congress is even if they had said something like, listen, we can't do anything about speech that we don't like, but we really don't like the speech. It's ugly and it's wrong. Israel has a right to exist as a Jewish state. And we hate all of this, but we tr- we're trying to draw balance. If they'd even said that, that would have been one thing, but they didn't. And here's the thing. They say that kind of stuff all the time. So, for example, in April of 2021, Claudine Gay signed a letter to the Harvard community accusing America of racism and decrying the shooting death of Adam Toledo, who flashed a gun at the police. Quote, we as a community must stand against racism. We must commit ourselves to the unfinished work of building a just society, one in which everyone's rights and safety are protected and everyone's dignity is honored. In a system in which police have vast discretion to stop people on suspicion of minor offenses, so many people in this country 
of color live with an ever present sense of vulnerability. Again, when, when she's talking apparently about American racism, then that's one thing. You know, she's very passionate about that. When it comes to accusations of anti-Semitism on her own campus, then it's all by the wayside. Now, Harvard tried to rely on academic freedom as the basis for why she should basically get off the hook scot-free. There's a petition that emerged on Sunday from various members of the professoriate urging the university to, quote, resist political pressures that are at odds with Harvard's commitments to academic freedom. But let's be real about this. They don't care about academic freedom at Harvard. There's like two registered Republicans on the entire staff at Harvard University. I mean, I went to Harvard Law. I'm just telling you, there are no Republicans on staff in the law school. When I was there, I think the number of registered Republicans on staff at Harvard Law School, which had well over 100 professors, it was like three. I could name them. And the fact is that Harvard is not a place of academic freedom. It never has been a place of academic freedom in any serious measure. But they're relying on all of that in order to protect anti-Semites. So now, naturally, the Harvard board stands in support of Cloud. They have to. They have to. She's a black lady, and she was selected for this position specifically based on her diverse bona fides, meaning that she is a black lady. And let's be real about this. The reason that she was allowed to get away with this sort of shoddy work for years on end is because she had the shield of intersectionality. If you, are, if you are an intersectional person, meaning a racially diverse person who ranks high in the victimhood coalition, then you can get away with just about anything on a college campus. That's the way this works. If Claudine Gay were a white lady and she'd been hit with these charges of plagiarism, as a student, she would have been out. She's being hit with these charges of plagiarism, let alone what she's doing as the actual president. But now, apparently, they're going to defend the quality of her work. That's the way this works. So Harvard University's board has now put out a statement, quote, Dear members of the Harvard community, as members of the Harvard Corporation, we today reaffirm our support for President Gay's continued leadership of Harvard University. Our extensive deliberations affirm our confidence that President Gay is the right leader to help our community heal and to address the very serious societal issues we are facing. What were their extensive deliberations? They met last night. Those were their extensive deliberations. So many people have suffered tremendous damage and pain because of Hamas's brutal terrorist attack. And the university's initial statement should have been an immediate, direct, and unequivocal condemnation. Calls for genocide are despicable and contrary to fundamental human values. President Gay has apologized for how she handled her congressional testimony and has committed to redoubling the university's fight against anti-Semitism. That's so amazing. So they just rejected everything that she's done since October 7th. And then they're like, but she apologized. But she apologized. Why? Because the edifice of DEI must be upheld. As we discussed at length yesterday, the entire reason for being of major American university liberal arts programs is to defend the idea that America is fundamentally unjust, that the American meritocracy is fundamentally unjust. This is why you need diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's why you give people extra points on their application based on their race. That is why you do those things. Is because the basic idea is that if you succeed in American society, unless you're a member of an intersectionally oppressed group, if you succeed, it's because the system itself is broken and exploitative. And so we have to rejigger the system by providing benefits, like, say, the presidency of Harvard University to people who are not qualified for that position. With regard to President Gay's academic writings, the university became aware in late October of allegations regarding three articles. As a, at President Gay's request, the fellows promptly initiated an independent review by distinguished political science and conducted a review of her published work. On December 9th, the fellows reviewed the results, which revealed a few instances of inadequate citation. While the analysis found no violation of Harvard's standards for research misconduct, President Gay is proactively requesting four corrections in two articles to insert citations and quotation marks that were omitted from the original publications. In this tumultuous and difficult time, we unanimously stand in support of President Gay. At Harvard, we champion open discourse at academic freedom. <laughs> sure, sure you do. And we are united in our strong belief that calls for violence against our students and disruptions of the classroom experience will not be tolerated. Harvard's mission is advancing knowledge, research, and discovery that will help address deep societal issues and promote constructive discourse. And that's the key word. Help address deep societal issues. You have to keep her in place because America is bad. American meritocracy is bad. And because those things are bad, she's unqualified and she's probably a plagiarist. Doesn't matter. We're going to keep her in place to rectify those grave injustices of the past. And that is the reason that Harvard's sticking with Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm fine with them sticking with her. The reason I'm fine with them sticking with her is because I think that when these universities fired their president, that's a fig leaf. I think when McGill went at, at University of Pennsylvania, I think that's a fig leaf. I think now the idea is going to be they go back to the donors and they say, ah, look what we did. We got rid of, they keep the entire system in place. All the foundational DEI principles that lead to anti-Semitism inevitably. Because again, DEI is a conspiracy theory and it crosses streams with anti-Semitism. Again, if the entire DEI theory is predicated on an oppressor, oppressed narrative, in which people who are successful are the oppressors and people who are unsuccessful are the oppressed, 
Jews cannot fit into that narrative because they are both oppressed, generally speaking, in terms of the number of times, for example, that they are targeted by anti-Semitic hate crime in the United States, way higher than any other group. They're targeted for hate crimes generally, much higher than other groups in the United States. They're targeted on campuses, but they are also disproportionately successful. And this means they don't fit into that matrix. They keep breaking the matrix. If you keep breaking the matrix, it turns out that people are going to have to shove you back in the box. So they cannot get rid of the anti-Semitism without also getting rid of DEI. And getting rid of these presidents is a fig leaf. It's a way for them to say, oh, we fixed the problem. Please bring back your $100 million donation. No one should be fooled. So I'm actually kind of pleased that Harvard is just saying the quiet part out loud. Fine, keep her there. And Harvard donors and all of my fellow Harvard alum, if you're unhappy with the way that President Gay has handled this, perhaps you should look to the fact that the entire university is reflective of a system of values that made Claudine Gay the president. That is the reason she is the president. They are backing her because they support her ideology. And she is the president because she supports their ideology. It is all of a piece. And if they had fired her, it would have changed nothing. Because again, DEI is honeycombed all the way through these administrations. The number of DEI bureaucrats on any given campus is huge. I mean, may outweigh the actual number of faculty on many campuses. Billions of dollars every year are spent on DEI nonsense. That's the actual ideology being promulgated at these universities. And it is poisonous and it bleeds up into things like the White House, where the White House now demands that equity be a part of every piece of policy that they make, where the White House now has to deal with interns yelling at them over not supporting Hamas enough. Understand where all of this comes from. It comes from a cohesive ideology about an internal revolution that has to happen in the United States. It's why Claudine Gay is protected. She cannot, they cannot allow her to fall. If they allow her to fall, it is a rejection of the entire ideology upon which they predicate the university system. If they oust the black lady for not sufficiently fighting anti-Semitism, that defeats the entire hierarchy of victimhood. Because that hierarchy of victimhood has to suggest that disproportionately unsuccessful groups in the United States are disproportionately victims and disproportionately successful groups are disproportionately oppressors. So you can't do it. There's no way. You can get rid of Liz McGill because Liz McGill's a white lady. You can't get rid of Cloud and Gay. There's no way to do it without, again, defeating the entire purpose of your ideology. And that intersectional coalition, it's shockingly strong and bizarrely constituted. So yesterday, the, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge was shut down once again this time by Queers for Palestine. Now, here is some footage of this. KKK, IBF, you're all the same. NYPD, KKK, IBF, you're all the same. NYPD, KKK, It's Manhattan Bridge. Look at me. IBF, you're all the same. Okay, now listen to that chant there for a second, because it actually means something. And this is the same ideology promulgated on America's college campuses. NYPD, KKK, IDF, you're all the same. First of all, it doesn't rhyme, but putting aside the lack of lyrical interpretation, that says it all. Understand that the people who hate Israel on college campuses, that the left that hates Israel, they hate America for the exact same reasons. There is not a single rationale they use for the hatred of Israel that does not apply in greater detail to America. When they say, for example, that Israel is a colonialist oppressor, when they say that it's a foreign imposition on native soil, what do you think they think about America? which again, was colonized. It was a European colonial mission. What do they think about America? When they say that the IDF is brutal and terrible, and then they're saying that it's like the KKK, and then they're saying it's like the NYPD, they're saying all of it right to you. They don't hate Israel. They don't hate America because they hate Israel. They hate Israel because they hate America, and they hate America because they hate the West, and they want the entire Western system overturned. That is what you are seeing on college campuses. And that's why you see queers for Palestine. Again, it makes no sense on any logical level. It's like penguins for polar bears, queers for Palestine. That's why we all laugh at them. Chickens for KFC. The minute that the Sharia law Muslims take over, they kill all of these people. But that that doesn't matter. These people believe that the Sharia law Muslims won't take over in America. They will take over in America. And they will take over as part of this broader intersectional coalition dedicated to fighting the white power structure. And anybody who's successful immediately gets put into the white power structure. Jews, now white, they're in the white power structure. Asians, now white, they're in the white power structure. Nigerian-Americans, disproportionately successful, kind of white. Yes, they're in the white power structure. That's the way all of this nonsense works. It's extraordinarily dangerous. And it's the reason why, even if they had fired Cloud and Gay at Harvard, everyone pull your money from these universities. Stop giving money to universities with billion dollar endowments so that they can educate your kids in anti-American garbage. In just one second, we'll get to the latest from Israel and Ukraine. 
So Joe Biden is now attempting to make the case that if you want border security, somehow you're in favor of Vladimir Putin or something first. The October 15th tax deadline has long come and gone. I know many of you might be dreading the stress of filing your taxes. I get it. Filing taxes, it's a long, excruciating process. I hate it every single year. But if you fail to file, you'll start to pile penalties on your tax debt. That's why you need to check out Tax Network USA. The team at Tax Network USA has a track record of success. They've reduced tax debts for numerous clients, totaling over a billion dollars. Whether you're looking at a $10,000 or a $1 million tax debt, they can help you with a settlement. It doesn't matter if you haven't filed in a year, five years, even a whole decade. Tax Network USA is equipped to secure the best settlement for you. Their expert attorneys and tax professionals can help resolve all tax cases, no matter how they started. So if Hunter Biden had called the folks at Tax Network USA, he'd be a lot better off right now. So don't make Hunter Biden's mistake. Pay your taxes. And if you don't pay your taxes, make sure that you figure out something with the IRS. The folks over at Tax Network USA can help. Don't let tax debt control your life any longer. Take that first step toward resolving your tax issues by visiting taxnetworkusa.com slash Shapiro. That's taxnetworkusa.com slash Shapiro today. Taxnetworkusa.com slash Shapiro. Also, if you've seen the number one streaming comedy in America, Lady Ballers, you might have seen us mention the creation of a women's razor by Jeremy's. In case you missed it, here it is. My man, looking smooth. Man, you guys weren't kidding. These Jeremy's razors are amazing. And did you know that Jeremy's now offers a razor specially designed for women? And don't forget about Jeremy's shampoo. And conditioner. They, they keep, keep our hair silky, silky and smooth. Well, that wasn't just a funny scene in a funny movie. Introducing. Yes, here it is. The all new women's razor and personal care line by Jeremy. Because Jeremy is all about equal opportunity to shop the woke free economy. Women deserve the same quality woke free blades as men. Two genders, two razors, because it really is that simple. Plus, we have a new line of personal care products for our better halves, including moisturizing, shave cream, lotion, body wash, deodorant. Ladies, head on over to Jeremy's Razors. Look at this beautiful razor. It's magnificent. Go to Jeremy's Razors.com. Get your razor and personal care products today. Okay, meanwhile. The Biden administration is playing a very weird game right now. They could get all the Ukraine aid that they are seeking. All they would have to do is, you know, solidify the border and they won't do it. It's absolutely insane. So right now, the situation in Ukraine is, in fact, pretty dire. Joe Biden is hosting Vladimir Zelensky at the White House again today. Discussions on a Ukraine aid deal remain stalled in Congress, according to CNN. And the visit, which the White House announced Sunday, is Zelensky's third visit to Washington since the war in Ukraine began. He last visited in September. Zelensky's visit comes at a critical moment in congressional negotiations for emergency aid to Ukraine. All of this is coming amid the fact that Ukraine, their offensive has basically stalled out. According to the New York Times, American and Ukrainian military leaders are searching for a new strategy that they can begin executing early next year to revive Kyiv's fortunes and flagging support for the country's war against Russia, according to U.S. and Ukrainian officials. The push for a fresh approach comes after Ukraine's months-long counteroffensive failed in its goal of retaking territory lost to the invading Russian army and after weeks of often tense encounters between top American officials and their Ukrainian counterparts. President Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine arrived in Washington on Monday for those meetings with President Biden and Congress. Now, again, the Republicans are hesitant to send good money after bad at this point or good money after good, depending on the situation. Right now, one of the problems that's facing the West is that a bunch of stockpiles have now been depleted. According to the Wall Street Journal, the British military has only around 150 deployable tanks, perhaps a dozen serviceable long-range artillery pieces. So bare was the cupboard last year, the British military considered sourcing multiple rocket launchers from museums to upgrade and donate to Ukraine. <laughs> that's how bad the shortcoming is. And all of this is based on the odd Western fixation with the idea that the Cold War was won purely through moral suasion as opposed to, you know, a giant military buildup that the West participated in for 50 years. And so after the Cold War was over. Basically, all the Western countries cut their military spending pretty dramatically. In the United States, every Democrat cut the military dramatically. Every Republican tried to rebuild the military. Every Democrat then came back in and cut the military again. We've seen this over and over and over again. And then it turns out that when you need it, the cupboard is kind of bare. The Ukraine war is just exposing that. So it's not as though Ukraine is the reason that the cupboard is bare. Ukraine is just the reason that you know the cupboard is bare because before the cupboard was closed. Now the cupboard is open. We're looking around. There's not even a fork over there. France has fewer than 90 heavy artillery pieces, equivalent to what Russia loses roughly every month on the Ukraine battlefield. Denmark has no heavy artillery, some Marines or air defense systems. Germany's army has enough ammo for two days of battle. In the decades since the end of the Cold War, weakened European armies were tolerated by governments across the West because of an engaged America with its vast military muscle underpinning the NATO and defense policy in Europe. The U.S. accounted for nearly 70% of NATO's defense spending last year. But as America moves more isolationist, 
everyone is realizing that uh, they completely defenestrated, de-armed themselves. They defanged themselves. Anthony King, professor of war studies at University of Warwick, says Europe has systematically demilitarized itself because it didn't need to spend the money. Meanwhile, the United States is, of course, ponying up the bulk of support to Ukraine. Everybody should realize that the world is a very dangerous place and they should start building up those stockpiles pretty much immediately. Anthony Blinken, for his part, he's playing. I don't understand what, what game the Democrats are playing here. They want the aid for Ukraine. They can get the aid for Ukraine. All they have to do is sign on to some strength in border provisions and they won't do it. Instead, they seem to be involved in this idea that they'll let Ukraine wither on the vine and maybe make them subject to another push from Russia into Ukrainian territory so long as it means blaming the Republicans for it, which is really kind of insane. First of all, it's bad political calculus. If Biden thinks that losing the war in Ukraine is going to not redound to him, that it will redound to the Republicans, good luck with that argument. That is not going to work. The Americans are going to attribute foreign policy failures to the president, especially a president who has already engaged in the single worst act of foreign policy to election of my lifetime, the botched pullout from, from Afghanistan. So I don't know what game they think they're playing. Here's Tony Blinken yesterday saying that he's worried Ukraine aid will run out. Aid was held up to Ukraine. How concerned are you about that with winter coming on? Uh, very concerned. Um, we need to see this supplemental budget request go through as quickly as possible. Um, Ukraine has done uh, an extraordinary job in defending against this Russian aggression. Over the past year, it's taken back more than 50 percent of its territory. It's engaged in a ferocious uh, battle right now along the eastern and southern fronts. Uh, we are running out of uh, resources already in the bank to continue to assist them, uh, and we need them. Uh, I would point out as well that about 90 percent of the security assistance that we provided to Ukraine actually is invested right here in the United States. I mean, I, I just have a question. So then why don't you sign on to the border provisions? Unless you're playing some sort of stupid game here, which Democrats are. Here's Chuck Schumer, Senate Majority Leader, playing the stupid game yesterday. The onus is on Republicans to show they're willing to moderate. Let me say that again. If Republicans keep insisting on Donald Trump's border policies, then they will be at fault when a deal for Ukraine, Israel, and humanitarian aid to Gaza all fall apart. Republicans would be giving Vladimir Putin the best gift he could ask for. Democrats are serious about reaching reasonable bipartisan compromise to pass this package. The question is if Republicans are now willing to do the same. Well, I mean, the real question is, why won't you compromise on the border? Even Democrats on the border are like, why won't you guys compromise on the border? According to CBS News. A remote desert region along the southern border has become a makeshift international arrivals area for thousands of migrants from Africa, Asia, and Latin America, hoping to work and reunite with family members in the United States. Over the past few days, large groups of migrant men, women, some families with children, have spent the night in a makeshift staging ground in this rugged section of the U.S.-Mexico border, waiting for overtaxed border officials to process them. Many expect to be released into the U.S. after being vetted by, bo by local border patrol agents who lack the resources and manpower to screen everyone in a timely manner. Migrants are setting up fires at night and in the early morning hours to keep warm amid dropping temperatures. Many brought blankets to sleep next to the border wall. Without toilets, they relieved themselves near the cacti that adorn the picturesque landscape of this national monument located two hours away from the closest U.S. city. The wait to be processed was so long in recent days that Mexican families and merchants travel regularly to the staging grounds to sell drinks and food, hoping to convince desperate newcomers to buy their burritos, tamales, and cups of coffee from the other side of the border wall. And yet the the Biden administration does nothing. They're saying that if anything is done on the border, that they will basically sink it. Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma, he's like, guys, you're not going to get your Ukraine funding unless you do something about the border. The border is chaotic, and he's obviously correct. We've got to be able to have a change in policy on this. Right now, the push and pull is really a political push and pull rather than is anything else. If I talk to just about anyone in the country outside of Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. they would say the border is chaotic right now. We had the highest number of crossings of any September ever last right. September, the highest October ever, the highest November ever, and we had the highest single day just this last week. It is l literally spiraling out of control. He is right, of course. And everyone knows this. Democrats know this. Republicans know this. Everyone knows this. But apparently the Biden administration would rather leave the border open and let Ukraine fall to Russia rather than just giving Republicans what they want on the border. It's unbelievable. It's such political malpractice. I mean, forget about the policy stupidity of it, which is unbelievably stupid on both counts. It is political malpractice to believe that Republicans are going to be the ones who suffer at the ballot box if the border remains open and Ukraine falls to Russia. 
Of course, Biden is going to be the one who suffers. This is insane. It's ridiculous and stupid. In just one second, we are going to get to Israel and the latest over there first. Everything's not kosher. It's a brand new show that we put out on YouTube with Brett Cooper this past weekend. Well, I mean, if you have seen this video, you will have seen that um, Chef Jeffrey actually made me eat tongue and chicken liver, and it was horrifying. So we had to fire those producers, and now we're looking for new producers at Zip Recruiter. If you're a business owner and you need to grow your team, your perfect gift is simple. You want a smart hiring solution. Look no further than Zip Recruiter. Right now, Zip Recruiter is giving it to you for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Now, you might be asking how Zip Recruiter is a gift to those who are hiring. Zip Recruiter uses smart matching technology to identify the most qualified people for a wide variety of roles. Zip Recruiter lets top candidates know when they are a great match for your job and encourages them to apply. Get your hiring wrapped up quickly with ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter will get a quality candidate within day one. Just go to this exclusive web address right now. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash D-A-I-L-Y-W-I-R-E. ZipRecruiter is indeed the smartest way to hire. Go check them out right now. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire to try them out for free. And meanwhile, contrary to public opinion, and I mean like public opinion in the media, because public opinion is very pro-Israel, the media seem to believe that the best move for Joe Biden on Israel, politically speaking, would be to side with Hamas. I don't even see how that applies. It's ridiculous to me. Is the idea that he is suddenly going to uptick in Michigan by like 10 points if suddenly he sides with Hamas? It's not going to happen. He is down 10 points in Michigan. Why? Because he is deeply unpopular. You know what actually is kind of popular in the United States, as it turns out? Israel, according to a brand new Wall Street Journal poll, it finds that 55% of those polled say they believe Israel is taking the military action needed to defend itself and prevent another attack by Hamas. Only 25% of respondents say Israel's military action is disproportionate and going too far. 42% of voters say they sympathize more with Israelis compared with just 12% who said the same of Palestinians. Joe Biden's marks for his response to the war remain at 37%. Why? Because his approval rating is at 37%. You could literally say, do you approve of Joe Biden's policy on toilet paper, and everyone's just going to go 37% yes. That, that's, it's, it's as simple as that. When you have a 37% approval rating, it is very difficult to exceed that rating on any particular issue. Very, very difficult to do that. But the media have been attempting to push this idea that if Joe Biden suddenly flipped on the Israel versus Hamas war, suddenly his numbers would uptick. Actually, it's the opposite. If security is restored in the Middle East and it is not a headline by the time we hit election season, that's going to redound to Biden's benefit. He's going to look like somebody who allowed Israel to destroy Hamas and reestablish deterrence in the region. That's going to be the actual outcome. But if he allows Israel to be victimized again by Hamas or by Hezbollah up in the north, which, by the way, is going to be the next step, Israel cannot, it's got 30,000 citizens, Israel, in the north of its country who are not living in their homes right now. Israel cannot allow those people to go back to their homes until Hezbollah is pushed off the border. There's now a large scale push by Israel and, by the way, France, other members of the international community, to push Hezbollah, an active terrorist group, out of southern Lebanon, about 30 miles up toward Beirut. The Lebanese government, some members of the Lebanese government, which is dominated by Hezbollah, even they are saying, uh, maybe Hezbollah should pull back or the IDF might be marching through Beirut in the next couple of months. But again, one of the things that is amazing is the, is the breakdown, the partisan breakdown here. So do you sympathize more with the Israeli or Palestinians? Democrats, 17% Israeli, 24% Palestinian. That's an amazing statistic. How you sympathize more with a group of people who have elected Hamas and the Palestinian Authority and who by polling data support October 7th by leaps and bounds over, you know, the democratic country that has human rights involved with it. That, that's an amazing thing. 48% say both sides equally, which is a way of saying I don't want to answer the question. For Republicans, the answer is 69% Israel, 2% Palestinians, 17% both equally. For independents, 35% say Israel, 11% say the Palestinians. Even among young people, a plurality, 31% say they support Israel over 23% for the Palestinians. Undecided voters are the most likely to say that the U.S. is doing too much for the Israeli government and too little for Palestinians. But again, the, this notion that somehow Joe Biden is going to win additional votes if he suddenly flips and sides with Hamas is ridiculous. I think Biden knows that. So he, weirdly enough, maybe it's because Biden is out of it, but he actually is not too online. When he allows his team to be too online, it's very bad for him. He's actually not been too online on this particular issue. So yesterday at the holiday party, uh, he suggested openly that he was a Zionist, which there are a lot, it turns out, I know that Zionist is code for Jew for a lot of people who hate Jews. Turns out there are a lot of people who are Zionists who are not Jewish. Namely, anyone who believes that Israel has a right to exist as a Jewish state is a Zionist. That would include Joe Biden. That's the warmth and kinship I feel so deeply with the Jewish community. 
I got in trouble, got criticized very badly by the southern part of my state and some of the southern parts of the country when uh, 35 years ago I said, you don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist, and I'm a Zionist. <laughs> You don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist. Okay, he is correct about all of that. Now, what's amazing is, again, the amount of propaganda that's being put forth by the legacy media about this conflict is truly astonishing. And and people are buying into it. So, for example, the Jordanian foreign minister, a person named Ayman al-Safidi, yesterday he gave a speech in which he suggested that Israel was creating hatred around the region. You're right, guys. Until, until Israel went into Gaza, there was no hatred, which is why on October 7th, the most Jews were slaughtered since the Holocaust. Other than that, nailed it. Also, I got to say, being lectured, the West being lectured about treatment of Israel by the Jordanians is astonishing, especially with regard to treatment of the Palestinians. Just to retrace Jordanian history, Jordan is a creation of the British mandate. They have no relationship with the people they govern, the kingdom of Jordan. Not only that, not only are they also a colonial, a colonial outpost of Israel is, the Jordanian kingdom had sovereignty over the entirety of Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem from 1948 to 1967. And they never once considered the possibility of creating a separate Palestinian state. Weird that. Why? Because they knew that if they did that, it might topple their own dynasty. They also have refused multiple times overtures from Israel to hand over control of some of these areas to the Jordanian government. Why? Because they understand that the Palestinian population in these areas is incredibly radicalized and hates them as much as it hates the Jews. But meanwhile, you got the Jordanian government sitting aside, lecturing everybody. It's just it, it, like the, the hypocrisy in the Middle East is truly an amazing thing. Here we go. Israel has created an amount of hatred that will haunt this, this, this region, that will define generations for come. And therefore, it's hurting its own people as much as it is hurting everybody else in the region. This is a war that cannot be won. This is a war that cannot be won. It's going to be won by Israel. And by the way, again, this idea that they're creating hatred. Let me show you some tape of a Hamas leader in Gaza. And here is a Hamas leader in Gaza explaining his agenda. I will translate. There are Jews everywhere. We must attack every Jew on the face of the planet. We must slaughter and kill them, God willing. Enough of being angry. We're fed up already. We're ready to explode. And you, the people of the West Bank, how long will you keep silent? They're trying to initiate terrorism there. We want to see knives. They cost five shekels. How much is a Jew's throat worth? Five shekels or even less, God willing. All of our people are ready to blow up. We've built a new factory for explosive belts. The off-on switch is ready for the moment we enter prison. Which, by the way, is why Israel's stripping them down. Sorry, the fence area. Our sisters are ready. The off-on switch. All our sisters are ready to carry an explosive belt. We'll open up a gateway or two in every camp along the border. And we'll continue to harass Israel until we reach you. This is why lifting the siege is better for you, Israel. Otherwise, you will be killed. By Allah, you will be killed with our explosive belts. We have built new factories for our explosive belts. Operating factories, we'll hand them out to everyone and send them on their way. No water, explosive belts. No negotiations, no to recognizing Israel. We'll never recognize Israel. Man, it's, it's, I wonder what the context is. For the university presidents, there must be some context that makes this acceptable, after all. The media, again, continue to do the work of Hamas. This is their favorite thing to do. Their latest attempt is they have in a piece in the New York, in the Washington Post, rather, by a person named Atef Abu Saif, the author of six novels and the Minister of Culture for the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. He has a piece today titled, quote, My Gaza house felt like a castle. Now it is rubble. The house where I grew up, where I was born, was destroyed a little over a week ago. No one was inside at the time the Israeli missiles hit, flattening it into a perfect pile of rubble. In losing my family home, I've lost a little part of me. Well, maybe the reason that nobody was in the home is because Israel warned everyone to get out before they hit it. And maybe the reason Israel hit it and it was standing five minutes ago is because Israel was hit with the worst terror attack since the Holocaust. But this entire piece is about the, the sadness of the family home being lost. Now, at no point does anyone note that this Atef Abu Saif character, who again is the minister of culture for the Palestinian Authority, which is hilarious, but the Palestinian Authority has a minister of culture. Because that, that, when you think of a, a governmental entity that promotes culture, do you think of the Palestinian Authority? I'm just going to point out in 2014, Saif said, quote, Israel surpassed Hitler's massacres. By calling Israel Nazi, sadist, and fascist for its military response to rocketing from Gaza, we are letting Israel off lightly. 
That is what he said in 2014, comparing Israel to the Nazis in, not today, in 2014. These are the moderates being quoted by the Washington Post. So yeah, you wonder why Americans sympathize with Israel? Maybe it's because those are the people on the other side of this particular issue. Okay, in just one second, we are going to get to this controversial Texas abortion case. If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro. Check out for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us.